you, Kirsty. Please get calling. We love to hear from you. But first, this morning, an author who sold over 82 million copies of her 26 novels to date. She's ranked in the top 50 richest women in Britain, received an OBE from the Queen, and even had her face on a postage stamp. Not bad for a Yorkshire lass who started life, or well, her career anyway, as a typist. Please welcome the wonderful Barbara Taylor Bradford. <laughs> When you, when you hear that, and the millions of copies you've sold, in, translated into 40 languages throughout the world, does it, do you say, I think, I can't believe that I achieved that? So, you know, starting out as a 10-year-old who entered a local <laughs> writing competition. I think the thing that always startles me is when I get a new book from the publisher and I see my manuscript is now a book and I look at the list of books I've written, I think, when did I do these? When did I write these? Um, and it has taken 31 years to write 27 books. But I don't go around patting myself on the back. I come from where you come from. I'm a Yorkshire woman. We're made woman. of stern stuff. Aren't yes, we? well, let's go back. Feet on the ground. To you that know? childhood that you had in yes. Leeds. Yes. Because from what I understand, your mum was a really big influence in, in yes, terms of your was. love of letters. Yes. She was a great reader and taught me to read when I was four years old. When I went to kindergarten, four and a half, five, I could, I was the only girl in the class, the only person in the class that could read. Um, I didn't always understood, understand the things she read to me and taught me to read because they were a lot of Dickens. But by the time I was 10 years old, I had read all of Dickens and she gave me the love of words. And I started to write then. But your first job was as a typist on the Yorkshire Evening Post. Yes, you it even, was. You weren't even writing creatively. You were <laughs> writing other people's words up. That's right. And I um, had done stuff for the local Armley and Wordly News. You're a Leeds girl. You yeah. know what that, that paper is. See, local papers, though, what a great breeding ground for, for so oh, many writers. Oh, yes. And those local weekly papers is where a lot of people got their start. Mm. Anyway, I kept doing little stories and slipping them on the sub-editor's desk. And they used them and they wanted to know, who's Barbara Taylor? And one day the editor sent for me and said, do you want to be a journalist? And I said, I don't want to be, sir. I'm going to be. <laughs> and eventually I was. You're a woman because of substance. He, yes, that's right. <laughs> and he moved me into the reporter's room. And, and, and that's you, how it began. You, and then you found yourself on, on Fleet Street working yes, in Yes, a these, few years later. Yeah, in these very male-dominated newsrooms, which you loved. You loved that environment, didn't you? Yes, I did. I grew up in Fleet Street, and I'm proud of it. And, of course, you know, you learn a lot on a newspaper. It's a great university. Yeah. And so how did you find yourself... I know you fell in love with an American. Was that the reason you ended up living in Yes, it is. Yes. Right. And where did you meet him, your husband? Um, it was a blind date. A friend of his in America was a friend of mine and she said, why don't you call Barbara when you're in London? And he, he did eventually, after being there for about two weeks, he found the piece of paper in a pocket and, oh, I'll call her. And he did. And it was very fast. It was love at first sight almost, you know. We just... And, and we've been married ever you since, to New York. you know. Yes. And so where did you actually physically write A Woman of Substance, your first, your debut novel? In New York. Which is interesting, because obviously... Yes, it's because so I was married to Bob by then. And, yeah, and it's so and synonymous with, with Yorkshire, obviously, the way you grew up. But writing it in New York, was that a strange juxtaposition? It was wonderful, because sitting on the other side of the Atlantic, I could sort of look over the Atlantic and see everything much more clearly when I was seeing it from a distance and seeing Yorkshire and, of course, it plays in London as well and New York and mm. Sydney, it goes to many places. Um, it was easier, I think, than writing it here. I know that sounds odd, but you get a, with a distance, you get a better perspective. And, and yes. your husband helped to translate it into a film, obviously. A yes, I married a movie producer yeah. who made theatrical movies for release in cinemas, and he became a TV producer and made ten of my books in, into movies of the week or miniseries. Which is obviously a huge part of, of the empire, isn't it? The fact that they are turned into... Yes, when you're writing now, do you have that... Because presumably when you started writing Women of Substance, you didn't think, what will this look like on screen? It was, it was a novel. So do you now think a little bit more about how the characters are going to play out on the screen? 
What I do, I think, now is think of it more cinematically and I think, oh, this, this chapter's a bit slow. I need something more dramatic. Not because I'm thinking it's going to be a movie, but I've learned to know to get cliffhangers in mm. at the end of a chapter. Oh, I must turn the page to see what's happening next. And Letter from a Stranger is a real cliffhanger. Letter from a Stranger is set, a lot of the book is set in Istanbul, the, the main character goes back to, yes. to Istanbul. And we were talking about this just a, a few moments ago before we came on about, you know, your love of the city and going back there to refresh your memory. And do you do, do you do all the research? Do you have a team of researchers? How do you get all that historical data so that it's correct? Well, a lot of the historical stuff I do research myself, but I do have help. I mean, you can't write the book and do all the research, and I've always and got a lot of... And sit on sofas of, chatting to people like <laughs> yes, me. Yes, and I, I've got a lot of historical stuff always in, in my books. Not, not from always from the recent past, but I make references to long ago in history. And that I like to do, and mm. I'm English, and it's usually English history. But there's so much research that you have to do. You might be writing and think, oh, wait a minute, was the Savoy Hotel built <laughs> in 1900? So somebody checks those sort of things for me. So a love of history comes into, into all yes, the novels, of course. And the work ethic that you still have to produce that many novels and to be so accurate, what kind of... How do you structure your day? Have you got to be really disciplined? Very disciplined, because after all, I'm not... It's not a hobby, it's a job. Um, I'm in 90 countries and 40 languages. Publishers are waiting. You can't not deliver when you're yeah. supposed to deliver. So I'm very disciplined, which I think comes from being on a newspaper mm. and understanding deadlines. So when you got your OBE, Barbara Taylor Bradford, did, yes. did the Queen uh, mention any of the books? Not any of them, fan? but she did say, I know you've written a lot of books. And I said, <laughs> yes, I have, Your Majesty. <laughs> and uh, some have English history. And she said, oh, that gives you a lot of possibilities. <laughs> and I could see her eyes twinkling. <laughs> and did she also and say, and you're almost like laughed, me? almost <laughs> you know, and I thought, is she thinking about her family or all those antecedents who tried to kill each other for the throne? <laughs> but she was lovely. Do and you think she... the modern royals, the young royals, do you think they make good fodder for, for future novels? What do you think of well, Kate Williams? Well, I don't Williams? think I'd write about them, but I do think Kate Middleton is the best thing that's happened. Is she an Emma Hart type character, is she, do you think? Who? Um, uh, Kate Middleton. Well, I think, actually, she's a bit not like exactly Princess... Not exactly riches, is no, she? I, no, she's not. And I think she's a bit like Princess Diana in a certain way. I think she's got that common touch, that ability to speak to a child or a, a person that she meets. And she's, I see from television, I've not been there, that she's warm and natural and, of course, she's gorgeous. And they love her in the States, don't they? Where yes. Well, live. don't you think they love her here? I do. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. But, you know, it's always a kind of... We, we seem to take a lot of stock from whether or not people are successful in America, don't we? It seems to reaffirm. Well, seemingly so, yeah, yes. Yeah. No, she is loved and she's a sort of doing the same thing, wearing beautiful clothes and looking great, which is good for Britain and... Good ambassador, yeah. as you are. You're staying with us, aren't you, on the sofa for a little bit longer? If you want me to, yes. I'd love you to. OK. Coming up, it's our mental toughness coach, Steve Seabold. He's here to whip us all into shape. If you find yourself constantly snacking, regularly falling off the diet wagon, well, give us a call because Steve will be taking your calls a little bit later on in the show. Kirsty is going to meet some horses, helping kids with special needs to get ahead. That's very soon. I'll see you after the ads.